Can I help you? I think I'm all right. Well, I can see that you're really struggling. Let me help you. No, no, no. I, I can manage. Well, this is a very big question. How do we care? How do we help? My name is Mike. And it's Ewan. Welcome to The Imperfect Clinician. Before we were talking quite a bit about caring, we were talking about caring about ourselves, we we're talking about caring for others. We've been discussing it even before we started to put it into our podcast about what does it mean to care, how do you care, and I think it is a huge subject and it is a huge thing to try to understand where do we set the boundaries, how do we care better, how to be more conscious when we care, and how to expect the care from others, I guess. Because it comes hand in hand with help as such. What do you think? Yeah, I think what you said about setting boundaries there really resonate because one of the things that I am keeping an eye out for now is... If I think I'm caring for somebody, I need to be mindful that the other person doesn't perceive it the same way, or it might not be helpful for them in the long run. How do you mean? So, like you said, care can be helping, for example. And when I want to help somebody, usually the intention is pure. I want to help somebody out because they're in distress or I think they need help. Sometimes the type of help that they need is not communicated very clearly. And so I'm not providing the help that they need. I'm providing the help that I think they need. Yeah, and that's the thing about help as such and about care. Do we need to first establish what do we need to do in order to care or help effectively? Do we need to make it known to others how we expect others to help us, if we want others to care for us in a way? I think caring for others needs to be done better with communication. So by that I mean usually when something happens from both perspectives, from let's say a child has fallen and you want to care for the child, you want to help the child, it's usually a knee-jerk reaction to say, I'll take you away from the problem or, or we wouldn't address it because I want to make you feel better. It can be similar at work when somebody is really struggling with starting the project. My first instinct previously was to just help them get started. But the knee-jerk reaction usually comes from feelings and not rational thought. So when I'm in that frame of mind, I notice that I'm not able to provide care, help, support as the other person needs. So what I've found is instead of going, oh, let me help you, because I think that is triggered by a lot of things, but mainly fear. And it takes a lot of practice, it's not easy. I tend to take a step back or force myself to breathe a little bit and say, just put your hand to yourself and just ask, do you need my help? What do you need me to do? Or it might be me saying, let me know if you need my help. And that is so hard to do because it's so much easier to just dive in and solve the situation. Yeah, but then you're putting responsibility on the person who might not feel comfortable when asking for help. So you're assuming that people are going to communicate with you on the same level of understanding that you have. And it's putting, you know, responsibility of somebody who might be in desperate need of care, of help of some sort but then can have certain barriers, you know, trying to tackle the world on their own because they don't have a practice of asking for help. So I think what you said about the responsibility side of things 
I feel that, let's say, if I see you struggling with something and I can see that you're shouldering the responsibility, when I dive in and help you, I take that responsibility away from you. But by doing that, I disempower you to learn. Okay, so your attitude in that respect is, at first, we should care about ourselves. Okay, we should take very good care about ourselves. We need to be conscious of what we need, of what we are short of, whether it's, I don't know, courage, time, whatever it is, okay? Mm -hmm. So you take upon yourself deciding on what is our happy state or what is our fulfilled state. And then if we haven't got it, then we make it known to others. Okay, so you sort of put yourself as the center of the situation, okay? We were talking about, you know, being self-compassionate in every aspect of it in the past. And it is very important to make sure that we realize when we need to look after ourselves in a way. So that, that sort of shows that we may be in need of some sort of help. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical help. It could be, you know... I'm struggling to see the link between the situation where the responsibility is taken away from you to what you've just said. Well, I think that when we are conscious of our state where we want to be, okay? So we find ourselves happy when, for example, we do certain activity. I don't know. I need to take children to school but I am short of time and I'm really struggling to fit this in. And somebody comes in, comes along, who has kids, for example, says, oh, do you know what? I'm dropping mine off. I'm going to take yours off as well. So would you ask for that help? Would you realize it yourself? Because that's going to ultimately make your life easier. Or would you wait for somebody to offer it to you? I'm thinking around something a little bit different. So for example, you struggling to start an essay and I help you start it. By doing that, you don't learn the skill of starting something because there is a fear of making mistakes. Yes, but then, you know, if I want to do it, because that was the situation that I was in the past, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't need help. It, it means that maybe I feel like I should be able to do it on my own, which sometimes is very difficult for us to assess. And that's why I used your help to do it. Yes, but I think there are journeys that the other party has to learn the hard way because by doing that, I don't feel that if it happens again, you've learned the skill to manage it. What about if there's a situation that we are in a position that we are able to help or we want to help and are we still asking for us to help them? Like, for example, I don't know, our parents, our children, are we waiting for them to assess the situation or do we step in knowing that now is the best time for us to help? There are completely two different situations, though, is it? I don't think it's fair to compare those two together. Are they if both you, fit within, within caring remit? Yes, but then if you're looking at a child, and it's very dependent on the child's age, I think. So if, for example, our five-year-old is trying to fold socks, and it's taking her a while, she's struggling. I'm trying my best not to help her. And I asked whether she needed help, she said no. And then I feel a bit better because she said no and she managed to do it. But the process of looking at her was painstakingly hard. But if you're talking about parents in our age, then parents will be elderly. Their version of asking for help might be very hard because if they needed to ask for help, I feel that that is already in dire state just based on how my parents are. That's why I feel that you're comparing apples and pear. It's not... Well, I agree that these are, you know, different situations because you have got children that may not be able to fully assess the situation. But then we come across many situations where we feel like we should be able to do something and we're not. And then we need help to, So you know, what you said about we should be able to do something... Is that not our perception of it's what we should perception. do to help instead of what the other person actually asks so, for? So this is the thing about the help and about care. Do we pursue our vision of helping others or do we 
try to establish what would be the best way of helping others by, you know, having a discussion how we can help people. Because I'm telling you why I'm, I'm, I'm sort of leading into this. Because when I was riding the bike this morning, I was having a little think about care and about helping others. And one thing that came to my mind says, if I ask for help, does it not always, maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes not, and this is up for discussion, is it not a favor? Because if I want to offer help to somebody, that is without, you know, reservations. You feel more you in control. Do it, and you feel more, more in control. Whereas if you ask for help, if you ask somebody, can you help me do something? Is this not asking for a favor? And it's good with favors to return them. Okay, so I, I guess yes, but also I think one of the biggest barrier to people asking for help, and I hear it so many times across different people, whether it's colleagues or friends or patients, is, and I quote, I'm happy to be the person that gives advice to other people. I'm happy for people to come to me and talk to me about things. And then my next question is, then do you go and open up to other people or oh, no because I don't feel that I can I think besides the favor side of things that the, the one of the biggest thing I feel is self-worth because you see your role or you define your role you boxed it into somebody who's useful somebody who can give advice and I am that person so what happens if I can't be that person what happens if people perceive me differently and and it's the fear of that I think that's stopping anyone myself included to ask for help sometimes and so what you said about assessing yourself and having like a barometer of understanding what's stopping you and what's potentially stopping others to do that that's really important but second of all is also, I think there is an element of once you've learned the practice to pause and you ask the other person, what help do you need from me? Or how can I support you? You need to take into account that it might be something that's stopping them from saying what they actually need. That's one thing. Agreed. And you need to create the environment for them to feel safe enough to ask for help. Well, pe people have a lot of reasons. People have pride, people have independence, people have got, you know, all sorts of other factors that led them to that point and they might have an experience of being completely self-sufficient and showing the signs of coming to you asking for help may mean that they are slightly losing the grip of that independence, of that ability to be self-sufficient, which I think it's very fundamental for a lot of people. Yeah, and I guess, especially for those people, it will be a lot of baggage, like you said, you know, going up or whatever that took them to this point now. It might also be their way of survival. For example, this is my only way of enduring what I had growing up. So being independent and not relying on people is my way of protecting myself and not getting hurt. And so if I lose control of that, I don't know what's going to happen and the fear of the unknown is too big a step to take. Okay, so let me ask you about where do we set the barrier? Where do we set the boundary of, of help? I'm going to tell you a little story that happened when I was very young and well, very young. I want to say between primary and secondary school, okay? We went for a hiking trip into the mountains, okay? It was back in Poland, beautiful surroundings and amazing weather, summer trek, amazing, okay? And there was this auntie that took some toilet paper for a trip, mm -hmm. okay? And you go hiking and you end up in a situation where you are far away from let's say toilets, okay, <laughs> conveniences that you would expect anywhere else, okay. And then there was a group of people, it might have been about eight or nine of us, okay. I don't know what people were eating, but the situation was that somebody needed toilet. So auntie let them have some toilet paper. Then somebody else needed toilet. 
and she let them have toilet paper and then somebody else. And then when the time came where this auntie needed a toilet roll, it was gone. she didn't have any. Where do you set the boundary? How I agree. Do you, how That's a good you... analogy, actually, because this is as if, so back to the situation where, where you say, I'm the one who listens to people, people's problem. Correct. And you are on full tank, first person, tell you the difficulty and you take it personally, right, your tank is now three quarters full. After speaking to, let's say, I've spoken to three people today and I've had a stressful day at work and I didn't sleep very well. You're now on 10% tank and then you haven't really recovered yet and then, and then two more people are coming to speak to you. So where do you set the boundaries of that? that? That's the thing. I mean, should should she have withheld, <laughs> bless her, and what do you do? Do you know what I mean? Do you give yourself all out to help others at your own cost? And that's going to make you feel, I don't know, fulfilled. Because for me, it just varies that people are different. Because the further question is, what is the expectation of help? How do you expect help from others? I said, well, she's got toilet rolls. She keeps it for herself. I'm going to be stuck. But I'm in need now. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think there are so many factors. It's interesting to delve into this for me. I think if I was auntie, now now that I knew I was not going to have toilet paper, I would have kept some for myself before <laughs> letting it to anybody. I would have kept some for myself. But also... Would you not think from the first person to the fourth person? Because the first person think, oh, there's quite a lot of toilet paper. I will use it quite liberally. And then if you're the fourth and fifth person, you're like, oh, yeah, but no, you're no pun intended. It's, it's the, you're still using somebody's, you know, courtesy, yeah? Yeah, but it's still, oh shit, there's not a lot left. I'm going to use a bit less. But <laughs> I think there's so much variables in this. If I was the first person using the roll of toilet paper, I'll go, oh, that's loads left. I'm going to be more liberal and I wouldn't save on this. But if I'm the fifth person, I'll go, oh, sugar. Well, Auntie I, might need some. I, I need to save I always try to be some. quite mindful of people, you know, helping. People's and I'm toilet always, paper. <laughs> people's, <laughs> I'm always quite, you know, uh, trying to be considerate and not overuse that because we're going back to, you know, to these favors. Because if you ask for help, you need to reciprocate it somehow. Why? Why do you feel that you need to? Because you feel the need to, somebody's done something kind to you, somebody went out their own way, okay, to support you in need, so you need to at least offer a return of, you know, some sort of help, yeah? And people who've been listening to our podcast for a long while might remember my health problems when I was very young. And uh, they might remember also the person that helped me find the doctors back in Germany. And this was, you know, a selfless act. Person decided to help without, he was a very wealthy person, very, you know, busy. And, There's nothing in it for him, is what you Yeah, there's absolutely saying. nothing in it for them. He helped me and... How do I, other than say thank you, there's not a lot I can do. Yeah, but do you not believe in altruistic human nature at times? That not everything has to be paid back. It might be, I don't know if you believe in karma, it might come back one way or another. Or it might be just how that person is. This for me was an example of such thing. Because I don't know what I was, but you, you always have like a natural idea, natural sort of, need to be of help to others and not only on this receiving end you know and i think we always have to understand that we always or there are situations in our lives where we are on the receiving as well as on the giving end of the situations and i think that as much as we help others others help us it's very difficult to go through life being completely independent and we at times need somebody's help and we should be able to accept that help. And I think we should be grateful for that help. So my view of it usually is more around grateful instead of owing a favor, because I think if I think that, it will tire me out, honestly. 
But also when you talk about that balance of receiving and giving, I don't know, but I've noticed that there are so much more people are on the giving end and afraid of receiving or even afraid of asking. So when we talk about that tank analogy, there's so many people who are, that I've seen, that are really stretched in life to the different level, you know, to the level that we talk about, whether you're sort of head above water or constantly bobbing in and out of the water your head. And there are more and more people that way for different reasons, of course, but emotionally that tank is not adding up. So you're saying that people are more willing to give rather than in need of help. Rather than in need, accepting help. Accepting help. Asking and accepting help. I agree that people are more likely to give help rather than to take help. But I, I disagree because I think that there is more people in need of help than people who are actually given help. I think that there's a lot of people who, including us in many situations, you know, that we give help on our terms when it's convenient to us, when we're not stretching ourselves, mm -hmm. and that may not be the full extent of help that people need, the full extent of care that we need. But then if we go beyond that border and go out the way, there's not going to leave a lot of us. Yeah, and this is setting boundaries for me. Yeah, exactly. I mean... And setting boundaries here is very important because in order for us to help more, we need to look after ourselves. Yeah. So we had a comment somewhere on one of our socials that somebody said that disagreed with us about like the self-compassion that we need to look after ourselves because somebody wants to be only of service to others. And what they are, it doesn't really matter. And I think that people who can look after themselves and being open-minded, being self-conscious, are in a more understanding position to help others. And they can provide that help not at their own cost, or not that much of their cost. It's not that much of a burden to them. And it feels to me more of a marathon runner than a sprinter. Because I don't think you can do only one. You can't just take care of yourself and not people around you. And you can't just take care of people around you and not yourself. It's a tricky balance. But I feel that if you take care of yourself, like you said, in order to help people, it feels that you're able to help people longer and even better. I think that if everybody, I know it's a hypothetical situation, but if everybody was willing to help, but only to a certain degree and not want, you know, because it's very hard to define, you know, where the balance is because some people can label you as selfish. And again, you're going to come across things that is called an opinion, okay? Because then there is opinion of how do you help? How have you helped? And people have got different ideas of, you know, how helpful you might be. For me, in general, caring and helping means that somebody is in a better position, either happier or something achieved after seeing me than before. That means that I've sort of made a difference. And that's for me as well. That's how I accept help as well. If, you know, I'm stuck, okay, let's say with this writing essay. Yes, I was stuck. Whether I was able or not to ask for help, that's a separate story. But you helped me. You cared about what I was doing. And you got me beyond that point that I was really stuck in. And that for me was help. And that for me, that's how you showed your care. And again, it's that perception, isn't it? Because somebody else might say, well, you've just taken away his only chance of learning. That's true. But then, you know, how much learning are you willing to provide to people before they're going to, well, become either upset or really, really down as a result of it? Because sometimes people don't know how to, you know, step out of this point where they're stuck to move forward. So being a devil's advocate there then, if they don't experience that 
and not learn the skills to step out of it, then if it happens again, they'll just slip back into that because they haven't built the skills and the technique and the resilience to overcome something like this. Well, I agree, but you know, people sometimes are heading in a direction that may not benefit them in general. And I agree that it's all, you know, good to say that it's a hard lesson and all, but at the time when they need that help to get to that point, that's when they really need you. They really need your care. They really need that support. Whether they are able to express that need or not, it's a different story. You know, teaching lessons, it's a different, completely different kettle of fish. Help and care is something for, for me, and, and teaching people a lesson is a completely different thing. You can teach people a lesson and let people overcome their misgivings or whatever, lack of skill, in a more supportive way as well, don't you think? I guess then that highlights the inequality than for people who don't have any one or any way to ask for help because it can be they're asking for help but there isn't anyone who who is willing to help them but that's where we need to listen out for those that need help and that's responsibility of those who are able to do it not at their own you know personal cost to drive them to the ground but those who are you know next to you neighbor that needs shopping you know help and caring is only as good as you're actually going to deliver because the willing to help is a bit different than you know than actually delivering the help i agree the action speaks a lot more than the word like i say to you i really appreciate you when you move next time i'll help you out and if i just said it and not really do a lot that's one thing. If I said it and then sent you money to contribute to your delivery van, and if I said it and actually came to you and helped you pack, which one do you think has the most impact? Well, of course, the personal touch. And there was another thing I was thinking about, paying for somebody to help you, okay? Because that's another, you know, the subject. I think that if something is to help, like, you're physically doing something for somebody saying thank you you don't say thank you with the money because i don't think it's going to have the same impact as if you sort of offered somebody to help or help do something else for them going back to favors effort and time means a lot more than money because money is cheap (laughs) (laughs) or cheaper yeah easier. easier easier okay so now we know it's not easy to help, it's not easy to accept help, it's not easy to care for others, and it's even harder to accept the care. So how about in our professional life? Because we care about our patients, we care about our team members, and how do we show that we care? What are the boundaries there? Does it change if you're doing something professionally? I don't think so. I think what you do personally helps you professionally as well so for example you've mentioned we've talked about the boundaries if you don't set the boundaries personally or you don't have the practice of doing that it's going to be harder for you to do it at work because if you don't say no at all it's harder for you to do at work because you just don't have the practice of doing yeah i I agree with that Uh, i agree with that But I'm talking about, I know that the best patient is the conscious patient. The best patient is the one that comes and asks for help. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of people don't know that they need help. You know, that's why you have all the like screening programs and everything else that may come across people who are in a need, in a health need in a way. But then there are those people that will say, oh, I'm not going to bother the doctor. Oh, I've been feeling not very well for the past, you know, six months but i think it might go so there are two different ones one is what you said people who actually need help but not asking for help and the second is the type of patient who asks for help but it's not the right help that they need so it can be all sorts for the second type of patient it can be their only way of seeking attention reassurance and a whole host of other reasons or it can be addiction and asking for help in that sense, it's feeding into the addiction. And also there are, what you said, the first type of group where they need help, 
but they are not asking for it. So it is a tricky thing to maneuver around. Yeah, because you want to care for people. I want to care in my, you know, profession when people come to me. But is it easier to say, oh, I'm not an expert in this area. You need to see somebody who is. Or in a private life, you sort of find out more to help better. I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily like a health matter or, or whatever it is. But do you think there is a difference between caring for people professionally, some at work, and caring elsewhere in our life? The neighbor, family, you know. I guess it depends on who you are. Some people will have a bit more distance at work, which one way or another sometimes do help. Because if you don't have distance, you take it very personally. And when things are a bit too close, like family member, for example, it's sometimes for me jumps from the let me ask what sort of help you need to straight to action. And it might not be what you need. And then arguments happen because that really helped you. You, you didn't even say thank you. But that's not the help that I wanted. For example, that yeah, situation. Yeah, well, and going with this theme, really, when obviously me being in a healthcare profession, the worst patients for us are our parents who may not regard us as the partners for a discussion here. So you want to care about your parents, for example, but they do not listen to you. And my parents were rather resistant to simple advice on, I don't know, go and get a flu job. Oh, I will. And when the doctor says, when they are going to see, the doctor says, go and get the flu jab. And they're going to get the flu jab. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a similar scenario when you're talking about the weight of family words compared to a friend's words. So, for example, your family member who is a nurse or a GP says, do this. And you're like, nah, not going to listen. But if it's on the paper or if your friend said something, or oh, suddenly... Even though it's the same thing, it carries way more weight. And I guess I guess people who are from the healthcare world might have something similar. But it's just, I don't know why, but I guess the why is a different topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's like people, I don't know, coming across some sort of advert on a TV or in a newspaper or on the internet or something, and they trust it more because they need that help that said medication promises, okay? And it might not be suitable for them, but they trust the advert more than the advice of a real person that's a healthcare professional when they come into me, for example, to discuss. Do you not think then in this case the personal aspect, because they know you, makes it harder? Like they can question you. They cannot listen, essentially. Whereas something that's a bit more distant, so for example, when they... You take it as a gospel. Another Mm. clinician or or the internet, they have a little bit of distance from that. And so... But you think that this is like a gospel? And they think it is a gospel, but it's not. (laughs) No, it's not. It's not. And we encourage people to have a discussion. I would encourage all people who want to look after themselves are listening to the bodies and they discuss about those problems with uh, healthcare professionals. We want to care, but in order for us to care, we need to know how to care best for you. And you have to let us know. I think that care and help is such a humongous subject that we're probably going to go back to it many, many times in the future. But for now, I think that at least we have some food for thought on where do we set the boundaries? How do we treat the help and care in context of favors, in context of, you know, is simple thank you enough? Or is returning the favor something that would be expected from the other party? Let us know what you think. Have a little think about caring for others, about help, because I think that there's always a potential for us to care a little bit better and also to care about us a little bit better. And what would you do? Would you have loaned that toilet paper? Exactly. (laughs) That's a tricky one. (laughs) Okay, thank you very much for this week. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. It's about time for you and Reeves. We're talking about Beekeeper of Aleppo, book by Christy Lefteri. This unforgettable story puts a face to the Syrian war when it explores the beekeeper 
Nuri, I believe his name, and his blind wife, where they experienced physical, emotional, and psychological trauma caused by war and family loss. I'm floored by how fragile and resilient spirits can be, and it documents the horror of the war with the contrast of innocent civilians. My heart really goes out to them when I was reading the book, and I thought I'm only seeing 0.001% of the tragedy and suffering of the people out there, and it helps me understand them just a tiny, tiny bit more. Thank you for listening to the Imperfect Clinician podcast. Grow and learn with us using our experience and flaws, just like we'd learn every day about ourselves. The best way to support us is to hit that follow or subscribe button. Thanks for your participation in our socials. We take to heart the ratings, reviews and comments. The best way we can repay you is by making this podcast better and by reaching and inspiring more people like you like us. Until next time.